can tell me when to introduce you. <laughs> and by the way, those of you who want to go out for supper with us afterward, you're very welcome. That's what we do. We go out and over to the pre pub and have dinner or at least a beer. Okay. Sandra? No. Just waiting for the thumbs up. Okay. Hi. Okay, welcome everybody. All, all of you, this great crowd of you. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming. And tonight we get a special treat. We get to hear Joy Kennedy, whom I have not met until today. And now it's, it's a great treat to have a to get acquainted with, with you, and uh, because I know that the work you've been doing over the years has been wonderful. have been working with the Canadian Council of Churches and the World Council of Churches, uh -huh. and you're still doing that, uh, the World Council of Churches. And you have something to do with Trinity College, where I think you probably also know Phyllis. Is that right? You know each other there? No? The Anglican Church. Anglican oh, the Anglican Church. Right. Social justice. Work. We Anglicans stick together. <laughs> Anyway, it's, just, it's great to have you here. And uh, the issue is so important because we have to find ways of funding many of the new uh, innovations that have to be made in order to save the world. Um, all of the threats, global threats that are jeopardizing humankind and the planet. We have to find ways of raising money to do this in a multilateral way. So. The notion of Tobin tax and other other uh, new ways of raising money uh, is a very important thing for us to be thinking about. So it's a pleasure now to introduce Joy Kennedy. Thank you. Well, good evening. Um, it's uh, it's really great to be here with uh, with you folks and also those who are watching online or will. Um, check in later. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Well, first a bit about myself too. I, a long time uh, faith motivated activist for social justice and ecological justice and climate change, climate justice. I am not an academic or an economist or an um, economic and social policy wonk or a politician or an expert. <laughs> But I'm an ordinary uh, lay person, a concerned citizen, a grandmother, and a former church executive who still pursues activities to leave a better and more just and sustainable world for my grandkids and everybody else's grandkids on this planet. And I don't think we have a whole lot of time to do some of what we have to do. I'm a person who asks why and why not? So for today's topic, my bona fides, I think, might be this T-shirt that I, uh, I think I've worn in a few protests um, as a campaigner. I've uh, been a campaigner probably all oh my, not even adult life, even as a teen. Uh, but um, this uh, um, particular yeah, one much. says, small change for the banks, big difference for the world. Robinhoodtax.ca. It's also Robinhoodtax.uk and Robinhoodtax in many other jurisdictions. But I just thought to give you a sense that you know um, sometimes you have to have fun with this too. Um, I won't wear it, but there you go. Um, I also have written articles on the uh, Tobin tax and the financial transaction tax, and I, I want to just point to a couple of them. Um, pardon me, uh, just uh, for reference. So as uh, Matt has said, I've been working with the churches and ecumenically and interfaith for a long time. Uh, and we had a coalition called the Ecumenical Coalition for Economic Justice that in 1997, we published this little book called Turning the Tide, Confronting the Money Traders. Uh, it was a, an attempt to popularize or have have in in, um, in church basements and in workshops and that sort of thing. Um, the whole understanding of the economic system as it is uh, currently and um, symptoms of a global disorder, that sort of thing. 
and looking at um, patterns of what was happening in the financial sectors around the world and in Canada, and looking at how you could confront them in an economic justice uh, paradigm. And so we had a big chapter in there on the Tobin text, probably three pages, <laughs> or oh, no, more than three pages, five pages, and then around a, a domestic financial transaction tax, or an FTT. So we were onto it then, but we were campaigning. Um, and this was just at the start of when we were trying to think through the Jubilee. I don't know if any of you would remember the Jubilee, but it was a campaign worldwide that was basically led by the churches uh, to cancel the debts of the most indebted countries. And we actually had some success with that. Uh, but you had to know the, the territory. To like. So um, we worked um, in the ecumenical community and in the um, uh, globally in the World Council of Churches um, for many years on those kinds of subjects. Um, more uh, recently, I say more recently because it's only like, um, uh, when is 2003? I guess that's 15 years ago. <laughs> that's more recently for me. Um, Dick Sandbrook, who some of you may know, um, who uh, teaches that or I, I don't know if he's still teaching. Well, he's sort of he's sort of teaching, but he's, he's still at, teaching at the Monk Center. Um, he gathered a group of us together, very disparate group, most of most academic and a few outliers like me, uh, to do um, a book called Civilizing Globalization, a survival guide. And because I had opened my mouth at a uh, some kind of a gathering where I was challenging back, you know. Uh, he said, oh, good, then you're going to write the chapter on financial transaction taxation. And I kind of gulped and said, oh, come on, you know. But anyway, I did. And then it, the book um, tended to be so popular that um, 10 years later, it was published by SUNY Press, uh, State University of New York Press, and 10 years later, they decided uh, it was so popular that it needed to be reissued uh, with up-to-date information, new, new writers and that sort of thing. So I said, well, you better do another chapter, you know, because things had moved in 10 years. And so anyway, this one came out, um, again, Civilizing Globalization, Revised and Expanded, <laughs> a survival guide. So it's in keeping with your um, topic of... Um, you know, saving the world in a hurry. We call this the survival guide for it. And it's, it has wonderful stuff in it. I won't go into it. But my chapter is on um, financial transaction taxation, curbing speculation, funding global public goods. Because now we were thinking about, uh, yes, curbing speculation and runs on currencies and that sort of thing and trying to stabilize uh, but also we were looking at what do you do with the revenue? How do you uh, start to um, calculate what it will cost and uh, look at how you would then spend in, in appropriate ways to support the common good and global public goods? So we had a big task ahead of us, and um, it continues. Um, so to begin... I want to situate my remarks in the context of my understanding and belief about who I am and we are in the universe, in religious language, in creation. And as a female member of the human race, I have a responsibility to preserve and protect this wondrous gift, the earth. And as a privileged white North American settler for many generations, I have a duty to acknowledge those who went before and cared for this place for millennia. The uh, Huron, Wendat, Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, the Seneca, the Mississauga of the New Credit, and of the, um, the uh, Dish with One Spoon Wampum Covenant. And those who still live here today and having an, an enduring presence on this land. So in gratitude, I also recognize as my brothers and sisters, all those around the world who live and move and struggle and have their being in the wider Earth community and the community of all life. 
So may we find the pathways to reconcile and make peace with the earth and with each other. And just to say another um, Sorry for ducking out of the screen, but another um, uh, initiative with the World Council we've published a few years ago, Making Peace with the Earth, economically, socially, environmentally, etc. And uh, so that's a project that is ongoing. Um, but in Canada, we have a particular duty to find ways to reconcile uh, uh, in accordance with the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. That's part of where we have to go in a big shift. And it's going to cost. So paying for the big shift, which is how I titled this, entitled this, What Big Shift? I want to particularly um, focus on the Paris Agreement on climate change, on the SDGs, that's the Sustainable Development Goals, of the uh, agreed to by the United Nations, and um, and reconciliation in our our own context. Looking at a, a, a we years ago, some of you will remember, where we were uh, proposing a new economic order. Um, now it's about a new economic order for a just and sustainable climate resilient and low carbon economy or no carbon economy if we can get that far we're we're in dire need of a massive shift towards equality equal uh, ec uh, ecologically sustainable and solidarity economy um, again in uh, religious language a greek word a metanoia, which means a turning away from something that is broken and not life-serving toward um, what is healing and renewing and restoring. And I would suggest that what we're really in the process of is a reformation. So last year was the reformation, Martin Luther, I mean, the little logo you had uh, for this talk was a little Playmobil Robin Hood. Robin Hood had a, an arrow. <laughs> uh, Martin Luther, 500 years ago, had another feather, and it was a, a quill, a pen. So he used words to start that reformation. Uh, it was an enormous change in uh, politics, in uh, economics, in religion, and... Um, it, um, it's something at that, that massive rate that we are in need of today. And I would say we need an eco-revolution, or re not revolution, a reformation. Um, because we only have one earth, one sea, and one sky. Um, and we now have to figure what feather do we have to pick up? How will we, uh, in this decade, as... Uh, privileged Canadians pick up a feather that will move us forward. I, I believe that some of that has to do with our reconciliation process with Indigenous peoples in this country and around the world. So the question is how? How are we going to do that and at what cost? Who will do it and when? So the Robin Hood tax, a.k.a. FTT, CTT, BTT, FAT, et cetera, BL. <laughs> I was going to make a little chart of all those things, but they stand for various kinds of proposed taxes, some of which have already been undertaken, others of which are just proposed in various uh, jurisdictions. But we already are familiar with things like, you know, GST and remember PST and HST and VAT, et cetera, all those kinds. So taxes aren't new. Taxes are human constructs uh, um, to provide revenue for particular purposes and priorities, right? Uh, so what are our priorities and how do we, um, do we reorganize our 
our uh, fiscal arrangements and our financial systems to um, to have enough wherewithal to undertake these big processes that we need. So, um, a little bit of history. Let me just see. I'm not going to give you too much history because that gets boring. But uh, just to kind of back up a little bit, this Robin Hood tax thing, and I'll use that one to start with because it's catchy. <laughs> And it's an image of, you know, make the rich pay, I guess, in some ways. But all of us who participate in the financial system are, in fact, um, the rich. Um, the early history of it is that, of, of naming it that way, was in 2001. The charity War on Want uh, re released the Robin Hood tax. It was an earlier proposal presenting their case for uh, currency transaction tax. So just a tax on uh, cross-border currency uh, speculation particularly. But in by 2008, the Italian uh, Treasury Minister introduced a windfall tax on the profits of energy companies. He called it a Robin Hood tax as it was aimed at the wealthy with revenue to be used for the benefit of poorer citizens. Though unlike the tax campaign for in later in 2010, it was not a transaction tax, nor global, nor aimed at banks, but it was the term that, that started. And um, so this Robin Hood tax started to gain, gain some traction and uh, uh, it generally refers to a package of financial transaction taxes proposed uh, by, particularly by campaigning groups of civil society, mostly from the UK. Um, but those campaigners uh, started to describe this tax as being able to be implemented globally or regionally, or even unilaterally by individual nations. Conceptually, it's similar to the Tobin tax, and I'll talk about that um, in a minute, but it would, the Tobin tax um, was particularly at just currency transactions, very tiny percentage of taxation on, on currency transactions, but the Robinhood tax uh, expanded that to a wider class of assets, including the purchase and sale of stocks and bonds, commodities, unit trusts, uh, mutual funds, and uh, der derivatives, such as futures and options. Um, so this group in the UK started to spread the word uh, toward the 2010, um, and it was run by a coalition of over 50 charitable organizations. The government at, of the day published a response favoring instead bank levies and financial activities tax, the FAT tax, F-A-T. Kind of like that term too, but they were they were citing um, pushback from the International Monetary Fund, who had released a report that was pretty um, um, well. It uh, it did discuss this kind of tax as potentially having some um, uh, some credibility, but they were very uh, suspicious of it and cautious about it. Anyway. Um, it, it started to, um, by the autumn of 2011, this campaign had gained considerable extra momentum uh, from not just campaigners, but also prominent opinion makers. And a proposal from the European Commission to implement an FTT at the European level started to become a possibility so here you have the wealthy countries saying, yeah, let's get our hands on some of this um, because we don't have new money to throw at these things like the Millennium Development Goals or um, eliminating poverty domestically or whatever. And so it became a kind of a, a push-pull among wealthy countries and vulnerable countries. Uh, in... Um, 2015, a coalition called the V20, uh, 
who were 20 of the top most vulnerable countries, they decided to call for a Robin Hood tax to fight climate change because they were the most vulnerable to climate impacts. Uh, and um, they uh, basically said, look, there's got to be a way. Uh, we, can't, um, we, we can't adapt. We, we don't have the funds to do what you want us to do in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. We need help. And we know it's not gonna come from official development assistance money. We've got to find another, another way and so they started to call it a Robin Hood tax uh, to fight climate change. So now it's starting to get very complicated. Interestingly, um, in just last September, uh, as you know, any proposal for a tax like that kind of comes and goes and things go in waves and campaigns go in waves. And, uh, but last September, um, at the Labour conference, uh, the UK uh, Labour Party, at their annual conference, they, they put out this release that said, after seven years of public service cuts, voters are looking for alternatives to austerity. Step forward, Robin. And they referred to a poll they commissioned that found, among other things, that two-thirds of Labour voters believed the UK financial sector had not contributed enough, enough to the wider economy. Clearly not enough had been done to make sure banks pay to clean up the mess they made of the economy in 2008 and on. Europe has had a, you know, years of, of trying to recover from those shocks and uh, they're not there yet. So here's a major political party saying, uh, now it's time to mainstream this idea. Um, and said that, uh, so that their uh, shadow chancellor uh, said that the Robin Hood tax would be a top priority in the first finance bill of a future Labour government. Interesting. By now it's clear there's a great need for more money to help those who are just getting by, and there has to be some way. Um, so Robin has made it mainstream, <laughs> according to the the Labour Party. Um, but it's interesting to note that while that's going on, you also have this idea being supported in Germany, France, and the, by the US Democratic Party as they went into their last election. It's very interesting that, uh, or to me anyway, that Joe, um, what's his name? <laughs> no, actually, Hillary Clinton identified that if she was president she would start to look into these kind of tax possibilities. The US have had a financial transaction tax since the Great Depression. Um, it was part of the New Deal. Most people don't know that or, or wouldn't identify it that way, but it's been there uh, all along. Bernie Sanders campaign uh, called to bump it up and bring it on kind of thing, you know? Uh, of course, uh, that's gonna have to wait a little while. <laughs> but in Europe, a major uh, initiative began, um, and by so in the European Commission, there's a, a possibility to have um, a coalition of, of governments. If you can't have consensus within the whole uh, membership, there's a provision to be able to um, have a group of at least nine countries come together to have a common project. And in January of uh, 2016, it was announced, uh, sorry, 2015, I've got that date wrong in my head, I'll tell you in a minute. Anyway, that there was willingness to go ahead um, and to uh, start to prepare the way for a financial transaction tax across those, it was at that point, 11 countries. Um, Britain stayed out, as did Sweden, but the other big players are there along with a few smaller ones. France is particularly pushing uh, for this to happen. Um, and um, as uh, again, as, as um, late as last uh, September, 
um, the new president, Macron, um, went out on a limb and said, this has got to happen, it's got to happen now. And he's very much in the forefront of trying to make this happen in, in that European group. Um, it's interesting that um, the only country to pull out of that at this point is Estonia. Um, they did in October, I think, and said, we just can't see it as feasible in our little economy. Uh, so, fine. But there are still 10 who are moving forward. And in fact, their, their commission sub-working group is meeting today and tomorrow. They, this is a, a proposal that they had hoped to bring on board by the end of 2015 or June 2016 to have it fully functional. But they ran into a number of technical mm, things that needed to be negotiated. <clears throat> and um, so they kicked it forward to the end of 2017. But they didn't get there yet because things have got a bit sidetracked with Brexit, interestingly, and with the German election, which has n not settled on where things are going to go. So Germany being one of the key players in this is kind of working through what it's going to take for, for this um, tax, this new financial transaction tax, to be able to be uh, actualized and embedded in their system. But the beauty of it is it crosses borders and it, it's, it's, um, it's a very simple thing to collect actually because those financial systems are all, collect, uh, are all connected um, through uh, web systems. Uh, there, there are different components of that, I won't get into it, but um, at the end of the day, they net out um, the transactions and it's, it's very evident. Um, and there's a, there's a fairly simple way of collecting it. Well, what about Canada? Where have we been on this? I want to say right off the top that um, last year in the LEAP Manifesto, there was a call, which is a call for Canada's based on caring for the earth and one another. One of the things that it says, and I'm a signator of it, so I'm happy to, to say, one of the original you know, group of us that signed on, um, the money we need to pay for this great, great transformation that needs to happen is available. We just need the right policies to release it, like an end to fossil fuel subsidies, financial transaction taxes, increased resource royalties, higher income taxes on corporations and wealthy people, a progressive carbon tax, which is coming, cuts to military spending. All of these are based on a simple polluter pay principle and hold enormous pro promise. But one thing is clear, public scarcity in times of unprecedented private wealth is a manufactured crisis. It's designed to extinguish our dreams before they have a chance to be born. So how can we afford the leap? Well, some of you would know Bruce Campbell and Seth Klein and Mark Lee at the Center for Policy Alternatives. And every year they produce um, the alternative federal bu budget. I mean, they don't do it alone. It's a you know, collective effort. Um, and um, it outlines how taxes like I'm describing and others can raise much needed revenues. It should be emphasized, budgets are about choices. They're about priorities. They're about values, as are taxes. Taxes are about values. What do you put a price on? What do you value most? And what do you see as expendable? Um, and successive federal governments over the last 15 years have imposed tax cuts disproportionately benefiting the wealthy, which have depleted the federal treasury's capacity to spend and invest by $50 billion in 2014 alone. And provincial tax cuts over 20 years have had a similar effect. So thus the imperative for austerity measures in recent years should be understood as manufactured. And so the alternative federal budget calls for a national financial tax uh, transaction tax that they think could raise about $5 billion a year or more. 
well, that could go a long way towards funding some of the public goods that we need. And as, as they say in, in their statement, our society has managed a dramatic restructuring of the economy before. When Canada entered the First and Second World Wars, our economy had to be entirely retooled for a new common purpose. Scarce resources were deployed for the task at hand, victory bonds were sold, new taxes were levied, household consumption shifted, core industries were directed to produce the goods and services needed, and in the process, employment grew dramatically. Is the climate crisis we face today really all that different? So, our tax system should also be used to promote intergenerational equity as a tool to reduce pollution and damaging climate change. Now, one of the difficulties um, in contemplating the scope of this is that banks and other financial companies not only benefit from the implicit too big to fail guarantee, do you remember that? Too big to fail? And subsidy from the government, the financial industry also benefits from the exemption of financial services from value-added taxes, such as the GST. So this alternative federal budget would rectify this by introducing either a, an FTT or a FAT tax, financial activities tax, as proposed by the IMF, at a rate of 5% on profits and remuneration in the financial sector, or a broad-based financial transaction tax at a rate of 0.5% on transactions of stocks and similar to the UK, and at lower rates on bonds and financial derivatives. Both of these would generate a similar amount of revenues, around $5 billion annually. Now, where has civil society been in this conversation? Well, I would venture to say that civil society are the ones that started the push in the first place. And um, having been part of that campaigning crowd um, and analyzers and all, I, would, I want to point to a few things. Uh, calls to the G7, G8, G20, all from Halifax to Toronto meetings. Um, in the ecumenical coalitions, one of the groups who, who um, have been most consistent in their analysis and uh, um, act, uh, advocacy have been CIDSE, which is the International Catholic Development Organization. It's, it's um, in Canada, the member of that would be Development and Peace. Um, in, in different countries, they have different names, but they come together in coalition. And they have consistently um, intervened to the United Nations, to different processes. And in June of 20, uh, 2011, um, they made a submission to the Bill Gates report to the G20 on financing for development. Um, and what they said was, while it's been a welcome shift in the discussion from whether to how a financial tax, a transaction tax could be put into practice, mainly thanks to developments in the European Union, the necessary political will for its implementation is lacking. Therefore, the SIDSE network addresses national governments, the EU institutions, as well as international forums like the G20 to push for this, which to finance global challenges, including development and climate change. When this movement was happening in Europe, the Catholic leaders on May 2014 Catholic leaders from countries that were part of this group called the Enhanced Cooperation Initiative in Europe, they expressed the moral imperative to implement a well-designed FTT, the proceeds of which be spent on eradicating poverty in Europe and in the South and to tackle climate change. They said, we believe that the freedom of the market is bound by the principle of justice and the commandment to love your neighbor. The European Union, its member states and institutions must pursue policies that aim at stability while not mortgaging the well-being of future generations. Policies should not be achieved at the expense of the poorest and without regard to the requirements of social justice, 
Such policies must uphold the responsibility that banks and other financial institutions, among others, bear for the financial crisis that many of our brothers and sisters continue to be burdened by. I think that kind of value statement puts it pretty simple. You know? We have a responsibility. It's interesting that the Pope recently has reminded us that money should serve and not rule, and apparently he's in favor of a uh, an FTT, we're not so sure about the Vatican, but uh, uh, we've heard it, <laughs> uh, that uh, that he is. He says, uh, do not yield to the pressure of those with a vested interest in seeing a toothless tax. We call upon you to reconsider your decision to only tax shares and some derivatives. We also expect a clear announcement about how the revenues will be spent, ending poverty and addressing climate change. Now, the World Council of Churches, um, who I've worked for many years with now, have also called for the use of uh, uh, FTTs and carbon taxes to pay for global public goods. Um, and so we've focused on things like the G20 leaders um, in Pittsburgh um, um, and in Canada. Um, with when the June 2010, I think it was, G20 summit in Toronto. Um, and so we've consistently tried to focus on what the processes are in those meetings to get these things on the agenda. Um, it's interesting that Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper was the strongest opponent of an FTT prior to the June 2010 summit in Toronto. He sent cabinet ministers to New Delhi, Beijing, and Washington to lobby against approval of any kind of transactions tax. And then he personally went to London and Paris to lobby against a tax, despite his uh, efforts. By 2011, several G20 countries started to declare their support for such a tax. So it's interesting because Obama, President Obama, agreed with this proposal by some of his advisors in the U.S., to endorse it. Uh, according to the journalist Ron Suskind, even though the president has declared we're going to do this at a White House meeting, no FTT ever materialized due to opposition by Lawrence Summers, one of his chief economic advisors. Summers' opposition to any kind of an FTT marked a 180 degree turn from a position he had taken as an academic economist back in the in 90s when he co-authored an essay advocating a securities transaction tax. But after his brief tenure as President Clinton's Treasury Secretary and a controversial term as president of Harvard, Summers had become a consultant to a hedge fund. So working just one day a week, uh, he reportedly earned um, $5.2 million US in just one year as he became acclimatized to the cultures and values of Wall Street. So support for some kind of an FTT continued to grow, particularly in Europe, but also in countries like Argentina, Brazil, uh, and South Africa. Um, and it due largely in part to civil society's campaign for the Robin Hood tax. It just kept it alive and kept it out there. So now you have things afoot in Europe. And what civil society advocates of financial transaction taxes emphasize three attributes. One, they can effectively discourage speculation in financial markets and the concurrent destabilization that happens through that from time to time. Two, they're progressive taxes that would mostly be paid by the same financial firms that received billions of dollars worth of government bailouts. And three, they would also raise considerable funds that could be dedicated to urgent needs like the SDGs, fighting poverty, disease, and climate change. So it's not only campaigners, but also um, <clears throat> in uh, 2011, um, toward that G20 meeting uh, in Pittsburgh, um, and Bill Gates was charged with um, with creating a report on this to give to the G20, a thousand economists told the G20 through Bill Gates that it's time for a Robin Hood tax. 
A thousand economists from 53 countries wrote to the finance ministers and Bill Gates calling on them to introduce such a tax. Again, to fight global poverty and climate change and help people hit by the economic crisis. Professors from many of the world's leading universities also have signed the letter. Signatories included Jeff Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at uh, Columbia, special advisor to the UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon at the time, uh, Danny Roderick, professor of political economy at Harvard, Professor ha Jung Chang from, from Cambridge, and Christian Fallow, a former World Bank senior economist. People like Joseph Stiglitz have been promoting this. So you're starting to get a cohort of, um, of leading economists, uh, and Paul Krugman too, I must say, Nobel Prize winners, um, Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz, um, wrote this letter that said, this tax is an idea that has come of age. The financial crisis has shown us the dangers of unregulated finance and the link between the financial sector and society has been broken. It's time to fix this link and for the financial sector to give something back to society. Um, then they go on to describe what it would look like. So Professor Sachs, who's very involved also in the climate change uh, negotiations and work, uh, said it's time for the G20 to agree to a tax on financial transactions to help poor countries struggling with climate, food, and economic crises that they did nothing to cause. The tax would also be a fair and efficient way to help close budget deficits in our own countries as well. And uh, so the campaign spokesperson for the Robin Hood tax campaign, Max Lawson said, if the G20 don't want to listen to campaigners, then they should at least listen to the experts. Economists have a reputation for not being able to agree on anything, so the fact that a thousand are calling for a Robin Hood tax is remarkable. <laughs> <laughs> now in Canada, you know, we're, we've been sort of there, but we kind of had a lost decade, if you might say, uh, where it was extremely difficult to get messages like that in, even heard in the public discourse. Um, Canadians for Tax Fairness have been very involved, of course, uh, in, in this whole question of fair taxation. And um, as early as 2011, they were telling Harper to support the FTT at the G20. Um, in 2016, they um, promoted it on, uh, on the federal budget that uh, an FTT or Robin Hood tax, as it's also known, should be implemented. Um, they've identified uh, in Europe, but also in Canada, strong public support for FTTs. Trade unions have provided results of polling they did uh, that shows that there, in fact, is strong public support for something like this, even if they don't know what the words are. Uh, so in um, 2012, an international poll was commissioned by the International Trade Union Confederation. They found really strong support in countries like Canada uh, for the introduction of this. Um, so you start to see a consensus building in the public as well. And it's true that while public support is stronger in countries where political leaders have also been supportive, like France and Germany, it's also remarkably strong in countries where conservative political leaders have virulently opposed those and other taxes, such as the UK and Canada. So. Well, we're, we're kind of interested. We're not sure. Um, what will be brought to this G20 meeting coming up in April, right? Canada's uh, hosting. Um, and so I'm not sure whether it's being revived because what Canada has to always um, uh, consider is its relationship to the U.S. Our financial systems are so enmeshed that and this is something Sweden discovered when they tried to implement unilaterally an FTT, that there was capital flight 
into other European jurisdictions, and they, they took a big hit. The Canadian government has studied this since, well, I have a report from, I think, 96, where um, the um, uh, Minister of Finance was studying quite seriously the, the implications of such a such tax, and they were basically holding back and being quite um, um, skeptical because of the very fact of our relationship to the U.S. And that um, even though the bank uh, of, of the city in, in London have not suffered a big hit for the kind of financial transaction tax they have, but they've had one forever, the stamp tax it's called. And actually, because it's such a strong... Um, uh, financial capital, they've withstood some shocks. Where we'll have to see uh, where the appetite is N once Europe gets underway. What's the appetite there for other countries like Canada, who have played with this from time to time? You know, there was once a um, a um, well, it was a bill in Parliament. I'm just going to try to find the actual year, but I think it was ninety. Hmm. It's not in my head. Uh, six, where uh, where there was in fact um, in the Parliament of Canada passed a, a, a bill that we should um, implement a financial transaction tax or a Tobin tax, and uh, it was uh, widely supported across parties, but it never saw the light of day. So uh, some of us used that to campaign um, at the UN around the process of financing for development, which was a major process. How do you find, fund or finance development? And we pushed that it was financing sustainable development. And the Monterey uh, consensus in 2002 included a provision for innovative funding, innovative mechanisms. They couldn't say, FTT or CTT or any of the other FAT because, and I was there in, in negotiations, um, it, was, um, <laughs> it was very controversial. Um, and what we discovered was that the U.S. completely held the countries who wanted to move forward, including that kind of language in the outcome. Uh, the, <laughs> The U.S. were being held hostage by Jesse Helms, who at that point, he was a very conservative um, senator, and who was on the um, uh, Appropriations Committee. And he made it very clear, they owed the United Nations back taxes, or back, not what you call back taxes, but it was uh, uh, their contributions for, I forget how many years back, that they hadn't come through with their assessed contributions. Um, and there had just been an agreement that they would pay up. Well, interestingly, the, um, the first tranche of this three tranches of money was paid. And then Jesse Helms made it very clear that if the word tax even came up and was discussed, that they were going back on it and the, the next two tranches would not come in. So Canada played a very good role in that conference, as I recall. Um, under uh, it was Prime Minister Chrétien was there, and um, it was fascinating how they kind of maneuvered around that. And so what they finally decided to say was innovative financing and innovative <laughs> mechanisms. But as we said in the press conference at the end of the uh, conference, it kept the lights on at the UN headquarters in New York was what it really amounted to. But that proposal, innovative financing, has stayed on the agenda since then. Um, and there are all kinds of um, moves to try to define what innovative financing would look like. And it can include things like carbon taxes. Now, we're going down that road after much toing and froing and dithering, but we are going down that road and it's high time. Um, so innovative finance has a place, and it's interesting um, in some of the discussions that go on, uh, at, you know, among um, 
the lead negotiators and um, heads of state. At one recent meeting, um, it, it, this was you know people who were connected with the IMF. Uh, one of the leaders said, um, "Well, you know, we made a start, a, a, a little start, in innovative financing with airplane taxes, uh, you know, airfare taxes, I should say. And because those have rolled out, and maybe at the beginning there was a bit of uh, pushback, but they're just automatic now, right?" I mean, you just expect it. He said, well, maybe that becomes the pilot of taxes and that that helps put, it, put us on a footing to start to, um, to look at things like uh, a cross-border currency transaction tax or a financial transaction tax that is more universal. Because if you institute it unilaterally, you have to face the, the consequences of what that's going to mean but if you have a collective agreement, which is what they're trying out now in Europe, uh, you have much more chance of it getting a footing, a solid footing, and um, then becoming normative. So what we're about really is changing the rules, but changing the norms and changing the values that underlie those. So um, it, let's, uh, I mean, there's so much more about it, but I, I don't want to take any more time that um, that would be more technical. Um, but just to say that, and then open up for some Q and A. Um, the case is building, and so like any movement, it doesn't just happen out of the blue. It, you've got to cultivate the soil and plant the seeds and continually tend the patch, watering it and weeding it and nurturing it over the long haul preparing the ground for what's eventually ready to burst forth. Think about the Me Too. I, I worked um, in the 70s and 80s and 90s in the rape crisis and sexual harassment movement. We got laws changed, we, um, uh, we trained police and uh, medical people and the coroners and the judges. We did trainings and education and stuff. And yet we still didn't crack through. It's cracking through, but we kept at it, you know? And sometimes it takes a long time until you get the consensus, the social consensus building to say, enough already, let's do this. So you take little steps that grow, that grow, and the garden can flourish. Um, so I hope you'll all uh, take from that what, uh, what it is and, um, and suggest that we can do this. Mm -hmm. It just takes that political will and rethinking, reimagining our power uh, um, to collectively make sure that the goals that humanity has and has set for ourselves globally get, uh, get funded that we pay for this big shift, that we find the way and just get on with it and do it. So, little Q&A. <laughs> yeah. Comment and question. Um, the term Robin Hood tax inherently is going to uh, cause a reaction because by definition it's taking from the rich to pay the poor. So the Jesse Helm experience is simply a realization of that very point. Yeah. And the comment might be that from a marketing perspective, you might take a cue from, from Madison Avenue and uh, market your objective in such a way that it's more palatable. Um, that's my comment. The question is, um, are the countries involved going to raise the money within their own jurisdiction? And if so, will they keep that money or is it intended that, that, for example, any monies raised in Canada might be used on a global basis elsewhere? <laughs> and I guess my final question or comment is, if the benefit of the tax is only going to be five billion, you know in real terms that that's a flash on the pan. I don't mean to be in the slightest uh, critical, but in real terms, it's, it's not a lot of money. Thanks. Yeah, those are really important questions. So the, um, 
the when uh, the United Nations was nego was um, creating the Millennium Development Goals that were the precursor to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, until 2015. When they were looking at that, they were looking at a price tag of about $100 billion. Um, in the climate work, we were looking at about $10 billion a year cumulatively for the, the absolute poorest, least developed, um, most marginalized countries. That's without looking at loss and damage, which is another, another whole thing. When you get wiped out by a cyclone or whatever, that's another whole area. So we're looking at fairly big price tags for those kind of global um, uh, initiatives. Um, in, uh, so there, one of the reasons that they're going a bit slower in designing this European model is to make sure they get it right, to make sure that the uh, revenues are equally shared um, internally in terms of European solidarity, but also for development. So they're looking at kind of a 50-50, you know, development uh, elsewhere, like Africa, Latin America, you know, for who needs it, right? Um, in Canada, the $5 billion, that was a very conservative estimate back several years. And um, as our economy has been growing, you know, it would be quite a bit more. But it would be seen in, in um, complementarity to a suite of other things, like carbon taxes, which are expected to raise more, um, and, and other um, uh, possibilities, so that you start to look at a fairly sizable chunk of change that is enough to start uh, uh, investing in things like the, the shift towards renewable. Uh, uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, and poverty uh, reduction or elimination, we would say, in Canada. So it's the best case scenario is not to do anything unilaterally. There is still conversation going on at the global level uh, with the IMF now, the International Monetary Fund, to look at what is a real possibility here. You know, they've now got to a point of being able to say, well, yeah, maybe this is worth uh, putting some some uh, effort into. In terms of the name, yeah, I think that the uh, the um, the term Robin Hood tax was meant to be controversial. Was meant to get a, con a conversation going. I mean, people had heard about the Tobin tax, the Tobin tax, they had no idea what it was, really. Uh, but it, uh, it wasn't very sexy, you know. But once you get something like, oh, oh yeah, it sparks an idea, it sparks a discussion. Uh, similar to something we've been working on in the World Council of Churches uh, uh, um, called the greed line. You know, we have the poverty line. We all know what that is and how to deal, you know, it's somewhere. What's a greed line look like? How would you define it? What would be part of it? And it gets a conversation going that is at a different conceptual level uh, to help you think, oh, maybe there are alternatives. Maybe we do need to start looking at, I don't know, I mean, it depends where you are on the, how fiscal conservative, fiscal liberal, <laughs> fiscal socialist you are in terms of how you would kind of define those things. But why not? I mean, I mean we've had great economists work on, on uh, you know, a formula for that. So, you know, it's how do you rethink things, really? Um, and then then start to see where it falls uh, and who's prepared to pick it up and do some serious work on it. But, you know, they're very serious uh, uh, um, heads of banks. And yes. <laughs> I think Norbert, you work with violence against women uh, in the places that I'm not aware of that at all. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so thanks very much for all your comments. I am um, very interested in this issue because, of course, we've got there is so much money, but it's not in the right hands. We, we know we know what the statistics are about the hundred percent, the one percent, and the rest of us. So um, one of the things that I wondered about, you didn't mention it um, in your evaluation of where money could come from, was the offshore. Investment and we have billions and billions of Canadian dollars and American dollars, of course. But they know I've, I've been seeing films about this now for 10 years, yeah. and they know about it. And every now and again, another report comes out about it. 
but they don't do anything. What's going on? How come nobody acts on this? I mean, that there would be money flowing. I mean, I was the disarmament <clears throat> development coordinator at CCIC back in the 80s when we thought there was going to be, you know, when, when the wall fell and the Russians sort of changed everything, you know, the USSR, etc. And we thought there was going to be a real peace dividend. But of course, you have to have the military machine going to have more wars, etc. So, but that's money that's just sitting there, and they know it, and they know where it is and who's got it. And then the Swiss banks, etc. So, tell me what's going on. <laughs> What's so, the for the people that are, are watching, yeah, this is really a question about, um, um, I would say, cashed money in offshore uh, regimes uh, to avoid taxes. And, uh, you know, it's been a problem forever. But uh, it's interesting how things like the Panama Papers yeah. kind of expose a lot more. Uh, so at least there's some understanding about how big the problem is, right? Uh, getting down to it is, you know, uh, uh, so I think that in, in Canada, for example, the um, Canada Revenue Agency have been given a little bit more power and a little bit more money to go after some of that, but I, I don't think it's going to get to the bottom by a long shot. Very interesting, uh, you know, when I've been kind of following this um, uh, process in Europe now with the European Commission and uh, ECOFIN, which is the Economic and Financial um, uh, Council of the European Commission. Um, they, you know, as they've been kind of moving along on this discussion of an FTT, what they've really focused on uh, in the last um, year, maybe more, uh, have been two things. One is um, a digital uh, taxation of things being tr um, uh, bought and sold digitally, you know, because that's a huge area of the economy that doesn't get taxed. Right? So anything you buy from, you know, Amazon, I don't know about Amazon, but you know, this this digital economy is huge, and they've just come to an agreement about how they're going to deal with that. And the other one has been this question of offshore investments and how much they're basically forfeiting. And so they're preparing a, a, a very, um, I would say it looks like aggressive uh, program on that. Now, of course, they've had to deal with some of their own um, places like Luxembourg and you know um, places in Europe who are basically on the Isle of Man in Britain um, and a few other lovely places and Switzerland. Now, Switzerland's not a member of the EU, but they participate in these discussions because of the banks, right? Um, and so they've uh, they've got the last two holdouts, and I think they uh, I think in December at the meeting in December, but also again at the meeting today in in um, uh, Brussels, uh, they are dealing with those exact things. Because it's one thing to get a new tax that will give you some revenue, but if, meanwhile, you know, the, <laughs> the flow is going into uh, un, uh, unavailable sources, uh, you know, what good is that going to do? It's like the money that you pour into um, development projects that gets wiped out by climate impacts. Um, and you know, people on the front lines are seeing that more and more. They'll have implemented huge, wonderful transformational systems, and then along come you know cyclones and floods and things. And um, so it, it's really important to get to the bottom, get to the roots of those things. And I, I applaud them here. I think Canada's lagging. Um, in the UK, they've done quite a bit of stuff. Um, Mark Carney somebody I wish we'd never lost um, uh, because he's doing some great work with global leaders on these exact kind of issues and as, uh, on a whole uh, at, well at a whole that's what I was going to say he's heading a whole group of uh, of um, uh, um, finance finance leaders central banks on the question of uh, investment in climate change um, and it's really stellar work. So, you know, there are hopeful things, um, or maybe I'm glad 
we lock him to a place where he has a bigger impact than he would have had in Ottawa. You know, who knows? Uh, so, so there are hopeful things afoot, but are they too little too late? Um, are we going to develop the political will to do what needs to be done? Mm -hmm. And how do we hold to account um, those who are making decisions about this? As a follow-on for that, um, I'm wondering about fossil fuel subsidies when we have political representatives in power that have been sponsored essentially by fossil fuel companies to tow the line. Um, how do we get political change to happen when corporations control parliament and all of our political systems? We hammer and hammer away at it and we yell and scream <laughs> and go to budget hearings and that sort of thing. But no, it's a, it's a really important question. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned the G20 um, at that Pittsburgh meeting, there was an agreement among the G20 that they would um, tackle this question of fossil fuel subsidies. And they would, uh, uh, they had a kind of a consensus among themselves uh, to do the work but to uh, on it, but they agreed um, to do it. Uh, by the time it got to Toronto, uh, and I read you that little in, in description of what uh, Prime Minister Harper did to that, um, it didn't completely go away because the good thing is there are people in the G20 who say, no, that's not exactly right. So, um, this is still a very big question, and it's one that is there in the discussions at the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, in the negotiations, and pushing for best practices to not just rip them out, but to, um, to ensure that investment is going into um, not fossil fuel related uh, uh, enterprises, but uh, towards an, um, uh, um, a non-carbon future uh, in terms of renewables, but not just renewables, efficiencies and... Um, Is that like the ISO licensing Enbridge, for example, in the province of Ontario, and they, Enbridge is distributing natural gas, but they're also creating um, energy efficiency programs and rebates and, and so on. They're connected. So it's kind of like you're, you're uh, um, creating a... Um, some, some beneficial change and transition while you're maintaining status quo at the same time? With a winter like we've just had, um, you wouldn't want to not have access to heat, Yeah. right? So it's how do you transition to um, a cleaner um, and yet not incredibly expensive, although it would probably cost more, uh, energy source. So how do you how do you do that in a city like Toronto, for example? Big issue, right? Um, and the whole electrification of vehicles agenda um, and um, power plants shifting. So good news last week was to see the the uh, smoke st uh, the the stacks at Nanticoke go crashing to the ground. Finally, the two you know that's been a long time coming, uh, but getting rid of coal fired and Ontario was the first jurisdiction to do that to uh, um, clean air alliance the clean air alliance clean let's hear it that's right with stellar work but that start that's now Canada's is now in the lead of a group of countries who are are pushing to get off coal and they are they are doing a very good job at it but they've got a long road to home I've, I've seen evidence that fracked gas is actually dirtier than coal mm -hmm. not in particulates but in ghg emissions mm -hmm. so have you seen that <sighs> Type of evidence going there, yeah, and one of the interesting things that I've just been in discussions the last few days, um, looking at things like uh, the carbon footprint of renewable energies or green energy technologies, and how um, the the downside of how they have not been as, um, shall we say consultative and responsible in terms of indigenous lands, indigenous peoples, and how, you know, certain, um, well, in other places like Africa, we're seeing land grabbing happening and Asia. Um, 
around biofuels and that sort of thing. So you have to you have to look at all of the factors as you start to look at a transition towards um, a low carbon economy. And they all these are all really important uh, factors to to consider. But we, we, the movement has started. There's no question. There's no turning back. Um, when you look at all the trends uh, and all the indicators in terms of moving towards uh, a green energy economy, I won't say a sustainable energy economy because I'm not sure we're there yet, but at least moving toward a different kind of economy, that has very much taken off around the world. And so investors are, are starting to do climate risk analysis of their, their big investments, and that's high time. And that starts to move things forward, too. Hi. Uh, I'm thinking of Paul Hallier. Well, you probably know Paul Hallier. Yeah. And you've read his books and the siphoning of profits over to Brussels. And uh, so major players like Tavish Stock and the Bilderbergs and the Deep State are always sitting there telling our politicians how to think. So the will of the people doesn't go very far when you get Harper told to go and perform on their part and have no tax. Um, so we're in a defeated position. Would you, a constant defeated position? So, you know, in terms of um, half empty, half full, I'm not sure I even know what the glass is sometimes. <laughs> but, you know, I, I go back and I look at little old Martin Luther here, you know. It took hundreds of years to get to the point of that Reformation happening. And it was a few, I mean, there were little bits. and He didn't do it on his own, that's for sure. There was that tilling of the soil and building, building, building until finally something breaks through and goes, wait a minute. And then it took years of having to deal with institutions after that until you started to see the effects of something called, at that point, a reformation. I, I really believe that we're in it for the long, long haul. I, I have learned so much from uh, First Nations mentors around looking at um, the impacts of seven generations, you know, uh, that whatever you do, you look and, and think through for seven generations and know that that footprint is going to impact people seven generations down the road. I think you can do it for good as well as for um, not good. Um, and so I think it's up to people like you sitting in this room and people online and uh, our families and friends and movements to be building that movement um, so that there's no turning back, so that the wall crumbles. You know, that wall did come down, Dorothy, in, um, what, 92? And uh, one day I was at a conference in, uh, uh, in South Korea in, um, Busan in the south, and we went to Jeju Island, which has an incredible peace center there. And it was all around the atrocities of uh, occupation and masses of people being killed, and then the Korean War and all that. And in this peace center, out front, is this massive piece of the Berlin Wall sent to them by the people of Berlin. So it was a sign of hope to say, you know, we're in this together and we can make walls fall down. Um, but it's not going to happen like that, obviously. And I think the more pressure we put on different parts of society, uh, different decision makers, eventually, I, I believe things will break through. I don't think anything will ever be perfect because we're human beings and we're a tiny little speck in the cosmos. But we can sure as heck make it better and more just, more equitable, more sustainable, um, and more precious. Yeah, Phyllis? You use the approach of the carrot, but there's the stick, too. Mm -hmm. And somewhere, there's got to be a wake-up. 
there's going to be hard talk about the terrible time problem we've got. We don't have seven generations. It has been said we have a decade to make substantial change in order to save the planet from being heated up. Yeah. And, yeah. and there needs to be an alliance between the people who are saying, if we go on the pattern of wars, if we go on spending for the military, if we go on letting the economic system increase the gap between the 1% and the rest of us, we'll crash. There will be no opportunity. Now, so far, the people who are talking strong on me seem to be young people who say, listen, it's my life, and I'm not going to have one if you go on this way. And I think it was people who were prepared to name what was morally wrong, what was evil, who motivated the incredible thing we've seen of achieving a nuclear ban treaty. So, in a way, we need to take seriously what Ursula Franklin said a long time ago. The moral is the practical. That's right. The moral is the practical. Yeah, I totally agree. I was going to say, Ursula Franklin chaired Canada as a conservative society back in the late 70s. Do you remember? It was, it was under the Trudeau pair, Father Trudeau, um, and it was um, under the Science Council of Canada. Canada as a conservative society. As a conservative society. society. We had Avery Lovins coming. I was working very closely with the group. I was still in Montreal at that time. And uh, we, and Avery Lovins taught us so much about energy efficiency, conservation, renewables, all the things we're talking about now. But he had those plans with, for the soft energy path. What should we do now to get there in 50 years? You remember the soft I energy path with Avery Lovins? His key thing was megawatts. Stop the waste. Because what we're doing, and you were talking about fracking, there's a wonderful film about fracking with Sandra Steinbrenner that was at the Planet and Focus Film Festival. It was the opening night. And they stopped fracking in New York State and in other states now because of the science and the health aspects that we were talking about. They were worse than coal. Well, we, we, you know, we shouldn't play who's worse, but, but it is it's bad. But they And other states are looking at their research and stopping. So that, that's a good sign, too. But, but Amory's aspect of stopping the waste. I Look, I'm, I'm at the university too, and these old buildings are just sieves losing waste, heating the outdoors. That's what we're doing. It's going to, they, no, but they all have to be tightened up. All these old buildings have to be retrofitted. The billions going into nukes, I've got some flyers. I'm sure you get Angela Bischoff's No Nukes News, and she gives lists of all the things that are happening all the time. Yeah. The, the bad, the good, you know, the, the conservation, the countries, etc. So, so I think what we need to do is really push for the energy efficiency and conservation. And I do think that if you look at the Clean, Clean Air Alliance website, Jack Gibbons has written extensively about Ontario and 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 um, energy efficiency and conservation and the billions that would be saved. Um, not just the nuclear stuff that the money shouldn't be going, you know, directly to the, the nuclear stuff. But, but they should also be very, very consciously retrofitting. And I, I look out my window, I'm on the 10th floor of an apartment, I'm on the 6th floor at Oise, and I look out and I envision solar panels on all the roofs when the sun is shining. You know, there's such an opportunity for so many things to happen here. But, you know, it's like the money. Stop the waste first and save the billions that are going into the wrong thing. But Amory Lovins said it all back in the 70s and early, early 80s. And there's a wonderful report, Canada as a Conservative Society, report number 27 of the Science Council of Canada, when they had a Science Council of Canada. Now, you, you referenced uh, New York, and just to say a, a, a sign of hope uh, was uh, last month, the uh, city of New York, uh, with the mayor and the controller yes. and the, um, the, you know, their finance guys and, uh, and others, um, had a great press conference. They are divesting from fossil fuels right. in a big way, and then they're suing those companies like uh, we would, uh, like Exxon and others, uh, uh, and have entered into those uh, lawsuits now. And they've their attorney general and everybody were involved in this press conference, and they gave a shout out to a guy sitting there with his beautiful white hair and said, "Oh, and there is." Uh, Former Toronto Mayor David Miller sitting there, who's uh, chairing the um, G40. I that Facebook Live yeah, yeah, the Facebook Live was really exciting, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so, and that's happening all around the U.S. Um, 
at the last uh, climate conference, which was in Bonn uh, in, um, I guess we were there in November, um, <laughs> the Americans came um, as a, I mean, a very animated group, uh, mayors and governors and high-profile uh, uh, corporate people and all, and they had their own huge area, and they said, we're still in, in terms of the Paris Agreement. Our government may be saying this, but we're still in, and so they're organizing strongly um, in the States right now, and you're starting to see some very interesting movement happen. So, it's all from underneath, it's not happening from That's underneath. right, it all comes from underneath. <laughs> and that's ultimately how movements are born, yes, yeah. is from underneath, you know? So I think there's good news. Um, but it's not as coordinated as it needs to be, but maybe it's a kind of a thousand flowers bloom, right? I don't know. Uh, but I think eventually things are ready to happen, and they do, and I'm thinking that the, the um, the impacts of things like um, weather catastrophes make people rethink their own situation. I mean, at that New York conference, uh, press conference, it was very interesting because they had someone from, um, um, what's the area that was white? Oh, Sandy, mm -hmm. um, when Hurricane Sandy hit, and people still recovering from that. Mm -hmm. um, speaking in this press conference too, uh, saying, you know, this is about now. And this is also about, let's look at the maps where New York City is going to be as the waters rise. You know, let's be real about this. So, uh, you know, that is what does start to move the needle on, on, the, on the dial. Um, when, um, I think it was, um, it was either the, no, it was at the Paris conference. Um, India was really blocking movement forward and yes. really um, putting the brakes in the G77, which is the southern, you know, the south, countries in the south, um, really making it very difficult. And so at the same time, the floods were happening in Chennai. And they were massive floods and thousands of people were being displaced and died and it was just massive. And so the civil society folks and some of the negotiators for the Indian government said to him, look, look what's going on in your country now. Do you, now do you get it? And he changed his position. Modi changed his position to become um, an advocate for the, for the agreement. So those kinds of of emergencies matter, um, but it's important to know about them and then to use that opportunity to say, like, let's get off the pot here, let's do it, you know? We know we have to, and so let's find the way. Yeah, Matt. Um, you um, are talking about countries as if they're the only body that's able to tax is a nation or a combination of nations that get together under some sort of uh, community, uh, as in Europe and so on. But uh, there's no talk about having the capacity of, say, the United Nations itself mm -hmm. to tax, right? And it seems to me that that is the kind of thing that would be a, a constructive, uh, I mean, multilateral institutions need multilateral sources of funding, I would have think. Um, is there any example of a place where they do anything like tax, uh, you know, where the, some uh, agency of the UN is able to create a tax? When you mentioned this thing about uh, airplane taxes, how did that happen? Who? Who creates airplane taxes, and is it worldwide? If you are there, countries where you don't have to pay taxes on your airplane tickets, or how does it work? Um, yeah. It seems to me a universality would be a very important uh, movement forward, but it doesn't. I don't hear it reflected in the things you're talking about. Yeah. Um, so obviously, so at the Monterey Conference on Financing for Development, um, we were talking about. Uh, more globalized systems and globalized taxation. Um, 
it's interesting that from time to time, it's been floated that there needs to be um, a, a world system that can, you know, share the wealth, basically. And at some point, uh, somebody asked uh, James Tobin what he thought of the Tobin tax, and he said, well, it's the second best thing. The, the best thing would be to have a universal system through, a, through he would call it a world bank, not, not the world bank that we know of, but he actually said this at a Bretton Woods conference, um, saying that would be ideal, but because we're not there yet, that there's going to be no political consensus on that. Uh, then in the meantime, it was kind of in the meantime, we should be implementing things that would move forward in that direction. There's, there's absolutely no appetite for it right now, globally. But I think one of the things that could be a byproduct of the Paris Agreement is that people put their differences aside and for the first time really came together in an, a quite an outstanding way to say, this is our global problem and we've got to deal with it together. That's climate change. Um, and it, it brought a consensus where they really are trying to find ways and means to implement that in a, in a concerted way now. Uh, so it has broken some new ground. Um, it isn't perfect, that's for sure. And its goals are way too low. Um, we're going to see climate catastrophes uh, happening at an increasing rate because it's locked in already. Um, that's the bad news. But the good news is you have much more of a consensus now about moving forward. And so the continuing conferences that are, are trying to work at implementation um, are, you know, trying to put in place global systems where everybody's accountable and responsible to one another. And that so far has been hopeful, even though there are big gaps, I <laughs> have to say. Um, but uh, I think James Tobin was right to say, you know, these other things are second best, but, uh, mm -hmm. but then you'd have to say, well, how would it be administered? Who would, who would, you know, make the decisions, et cetera, et cetera, for any kind of a, of a world project. But the, the financial systems are integrated enough globally, you know, how you can send transfers like that anywhere. Uh, that's because they have a swift uh, process and, and other things. So it, technically it's feasible. People like um, uh, um, Ronald Schmidt from Canada proved that years ago, how technically feasible it was. And, uh, and others, you know, have, have uh, commented on that. One thing I didn't say, which might be of interest, is that China implemented a um, currency, um, yeah, a, a, a CTT, no, an FTT, um, just a few years ago. It was to prevent a run on the yuan as they were um, changing some policies. And, um, and so, you know, if China can do it, for heaven's sake, you know. Now, that was more of a protectionist measure in terms of their own economy, but they did it. They didn't have any qualms about it. They can do whatever they want it's, if they don't have any opposition. It's incredible, <laughs> you know. Yes, so that's right. But would they cooperate in a global regime? A doubtful. Um, well, and they might, you know. I mean, they're they're moving forward in such a way that who knows? They might. Um, uh, would that be a good thing? I don't know. But anyway, um, so we can contemplate, and we have to vision for the future. I mean, it's important to have a vision. It's important to then find all the problems with that vision uh, and how impossible it is and how, you know, um, oh, this is why you can't. But I still ask why and why not and how and how not. And, you know, I mean, Nelson Mandela said it's impossible until it's done. Right? Mm -hmm. That's our job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, question first, as a comment. Could you give an example of how a financial transaction tax, transaction tax would affect something bad that's happening inside the banking system, speculation you mentioned? How, could you explain how that works? I mean, if it's just a matter of collecting, let's say, another 10 or $20 billion from the Canadian banking cartel, 
you could do that just by increasing corporate taxation. So what advantage in particular would come from a Tobin tax? It's a technical question. If it, yeah. and a, a general comment is that uh, <clears throat> people have always, always been talking as if governments see their job to make life more fair. I mean, all the evidence of my young 70 years is that governments are there to keep the present system intact. Exactly. And they've changed from a system in the 60s when the marginal individual taxation rate in England was about 90%, and corporate taxation in the United States was about 50%, to a huge shift to sales taxes, VAT taxes, and um, lower personal income taxes for the rich, dramatically reduced uh, death taxes, as they're called, and lower corporate tax. So I'm not persuaded by anybody that any government that I've witnessed in the last 70 years has really been interested in greatly fixing the system more fairly. I mean, Margaret Thatcher said her greatest achievement was new labor. The British financial system grew up greatly under Tony Blair. We now have an NDP government in Alberta whose desperate mission is to keep the tar sands going and so on and then to give them a break and the loyalties, the royalties there, the royalties there. So uh, not, I'm just curious about what is there special about a Tobin tax that is in any way going to contribute to a shift in power relations. Yeah, I, I think that's the nub, you know. Uh, so the the technical thing around uh, a Tobin tax is that it's to put a break on speculation. Uh, like James Tobin himself said back when he, he, he uh, put it forward, was to kind of put sand in the wheels of the, what, of what the system. Of so I mean, buy a share of yeah, it, but if, so it wouldn't be individual, personal, financial stuff that goes on. Okay. It would be like hedge funds, for example. Um, and that's where you're getting most of the pushback uh, uh, in terms of resistance, and that's from the hedge fund uh, owners. It, it, it's, it's, um, <laughs> I wish I could find it. I wonder if I've got it handy. So even Chrétien, for uh, <laughs> his uh, interesting perspectives on things, um, uh, when he, when he was uh, prime minister, he was addressing a um, a group of former government. Or just after he was uh, out of office, he was addressing a group of former heads of state and uh, talking about the pros and cons of this and that. But he said, you know, basically, uh, if I can find the exact words. But anyway, what he actually said was you know, we may want to do, when we're in government, we may want to do a whole lot of these things, but basically we're being held hostage by the guys in red suspenders, the the, the currency traders and the, the sort of Wall Street guys, the young ones in red suspenders. That's how he characterized them, that basically um, the, the pushback from people that have this vested interest in growth in financial markets. And we're talking about markets here, we're not talking about the economy per se, but of markets and the financial instruments that they create, is always to get more, always to get more. Yeah, but How do you hold that back? That governments are the victims of some nasty by No, they let it happen. I mean, I'm saying they've been sponsoring oh, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, that's right. They with the, the neoliberal agenda. But they no, that's right. And the Washington consensus uh -huh. and all that. That's right. Maybe the social democratic governments of Europe and yeah. Uh, Canada. Yeah. So, so the question is, what power do citizens have at all? Um, yeah. How do we break this kind of uh, juggernaut? Because it is like a juggernaut. Um, and where are there signs of hope? And what kind of emergencies are we going to experience? So one of the things that we missed the opportunity for after the 2008 crisis, that was the time to come in and make the kind of changes that 
you know, where they had to own up to the mess they'd made. Yeah, what did they do? They uh, basically bailed them out. Obama bailed them yes. out. Obama, Obama did not do that. And in Britain, no. they did the same they thing. They did, yeah. And in Europe, they did the same thing. That's right. So that's my point. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, no, it's a very There's no evidence point. that governments are there to make life fair. They're there to yeah. keep the system going. That's, yeah. that's what it seems to me. I think you're wrong. But things can yeah. happen. Yeah, in go ahead. In the 60s, we got, we got paying... Our health system, we got it for everybody. That's a sign that there was a, a movement to keep society more equal. Yes. And there was a lot of development in the 60s that made life yeah. more balanced, more opportunity for more people. And you have to, you have to be clear, 1% um, may be hopelessly selfish, but a lot of people are really generous. Mm -hmm. And generosity and caring for other people and looking after Earth is a quality that is all over the world. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of good people, and we are more. We are, we are more numerous than they. I'm not suggesting that there has been no reform since capitalism emerged four hundred years ago. It has changed in accordance with the measure of threat. But all the evidence is the neoliberal mode of existence. Since the 1970s, the shift in taxation, which you're talking and about, and that's what we have to break. I yes, agree with you. Has been yeah. has been implemented by yeah. governments. Yeah. Okay. You're absolutely right. No, that's true, and that's why I say it's like a government. The NDP are in but, power in Alberta, and what are they doing? Trying to stay in power. Yeah, yeah but look, but you also have to look at the mess they inherited too. You know. Power. Okay. But I think they, my hope is for the native people because they're trying to stop the pipelines and they're trying to stop tar sands. Yeah. And I think they there are a lot of treaties that have been broken and they're trying to open up the books. I don't know if everybody has seen that film by Alan Esau Bombsman. It's called Trick or Treaty. And it's about, you know, it's a quote from somebody in the film who is working on way. opening up the treaties because they were lied to. You know, the elders were told one story by the governments of the J and the uh, Hudson Bay Company. And they signed an X because they didn't know how to read English. And now a lot of young scholars and First Nation scholars and lawyers are opening those treaties, treaties and seeing where the lies are. So that's a, it's a National Film Award film by Alan Isobamsalan, who's a wonderful um, NFB brilliant um, sister, <laughs> Studio D, one of my sisters is Studio D at the National Film Award way back when. Um, she is in her 80s. She produces another film every year. <coughs> And um, this this one was, I think, two years ago, Trick or Treaty. And it's it's a quote from somebody who is opening those books to look at the treaties. And that's what a lot of stuff is going to be happening in terms of the recognition. And when they talk about truth and reconciliation, the way it's going now is not the way a lot of people are happy with because they don't think it's going far enough and, and, and hard enough. Um, one thing I did want to mention, Joy, and we haven't talked about the local stuff here, we have an election, a provincial election coming up on June the 7th, and we really need to be, and I've been listening to the people who are vying to be head of the Conservative Party on the radio, and each one is worse than the other when it comes to the climate change. I don't know if you've heard them, they're, they're really, oh, they, yeah. they, they don't want any kind that of, is our, they don't any want kind of climate change. And if they get into power, God help us all, because we are it's, they're going to cut back on so many social programs and environmental programs and the Green Energy Act and feed-in tariffs and all the things that are helping to move uh, uh, an agenda forward. Uh, it's not wonderful and it's not working that all that great and there are a lot of criticism. But they're, they're listening to the, the critics of the windmills. You know, that's a whole other story, but it's very political. So I think people need to start to think about this provincial election. And <clears throat> but on the federal level, um, I work with Lynn, Lynn McDonald and others on uh, a group that's called um, uh, Just Earth, Justice for the Earth. Yeah, I'm sure you're familiar with mm -hmm. So Lynn McDonald, as many of you know, she was a, a former member of Parliament um, 28 years ago. And it was her private member still that led to the no smoking legislation in Canada. First in the world. And she, and she, knows how all these things work. She knows all that stuff. So she has us going to visit our members of parliament on climate change. We do these, we do this every, for the last three years, 
people have been going to speak to their federal members of parliament. Many of them are liberal now because, of course, the liberals got and took away all our NDP people here. But we go to meet with them. Mine is Krista Freeland. She's never there. But we, we meet with her executive assistant. It is very smart, and he knows. And he brings our letters and our messages to her. You know, how she deals that with that, we don't know inside when they have their caucus meetings. But if, if there'd be a lot of that kind of push from the different, because they meet every Wednesday, right? The MPs meet every Wednesday and they talk about what, you know, what they're hearing about it doing. And what we need to do here is, is be active. So we're talking about, you're talking about, of course, global issues and UN stuff and so on and so on, which of course we're all concerned about doing stuff as well. Most of women is having its big dinner tomorrow night, having the awards and all of that. But, but uh, I think that we really need to see what we're going to do with this election coming up, our provincial election, because we may have some really bad setbacks if God forbid they get in and they're all talking about how terrible the current liberal provincial government is and how they want to stop it and destroy it and stop the money flowing out to all these programs. They talk about it. They're quite honest. So I think people need to just put our minds to what's going on here as well as all the international stuff. Well, and back to your point, too, about governments. I mean, it, it's, it's the ongoing um, dilemma, isn't it? About as a, and I said I'm an ordinary citizen, you know. So I have the responsibility of an ordinary citizen to do whatever you know is in my capacity, right? Uh, and to join forces with other ordinary citizens to understand that system change um, doesn't happen. At, uh, it doesn't happen from the goodwill of the politicians or the government of the day. It happens by a force being pushed so that there is no way they can avoid it. And the best politicians will tell you that. The real movement happens when there is such a hue and cry that they can do no, no other, you know? Um, and I mean, Paul Martin, when he was prime minister, uh, we were having a little meeting with him about something. And, uh, and he said, you know, I have to tell you, that the most successful campaign you folks have been part of is that Jubilee campaign. I couldn't go anywhere. I couldn't go to church without some people confronting me and saying, so would you sign this? And what are you doing about that? And how are you, you know, he said, I just couldn't avoid it. I, you know, we couldn't, <laughs> we had to act. <laughs> so yeah, um, mobilization. We have, to, we have to let them know that their constituents that's are right. concerned because they want to get reelected. That's yeah. That's the whole. So it's mobilize, mobilize, yeah. you know. Um, and But you have to mobilize with a goal uh, and an idea and something you're willing to roll up your sleeves and, you know, take the lumps that come with it too. Yeah. Um, just taking a look at the Climate Change Action Plan by the Liberals and the movement to transition off uh, fossil fuels and uh, increase energy efficiency in the province, there's some really great programs that they've put into place. Um, I personally had input on some of the uh, programs around the retrofit of colleges and universities um, for advanced education. And there's some really robust thought behind it. Um, and I'm impressed by the scope of the Climate Change Action Plan, because it just isn't one solution. It's in many sectors, whether it's built environment or re or um, vehicles or home energy thermostats, like it goes right down to that. So do you think that they're, they're taking action in, in a way that is suitable for the province? And what what do you see as a gap that they might be missing out on or, um, well, or a, a way of doing things? To, yeah. Because right now they're taxing the large emitters yeah. and putting it on the carbon market. Mm -hmm. um, how does that compare to this Robin Hood tax and, and that strategy? Uh, so the good thing is that they're part of a group of states and provinces who are prepared to work together. So you can do, an, I mean, 
yes, you have to do certain things for, for your own jurisdiction, for the province, and you've got decision making <coughs> around that. But if you collaborate across borders and across provincial boundaries, you can start to, to think about system change. So these, um, you know, the way they're, they're dealing with emissions now and trying to even it out um, through energy systems and how, they're, you know, how the Western Initiative of provinces and states goes forward, there's some real hope in that. Um, and, and I think what's been happening with the Pan-Canadian plan also is really important for the first time, you have the provinces and territories having to make decisions together in a way that will benefit the whole country. So Ontario's role in that as one of the largest uh, members of you know, large populations and um, size um, is really critical. Um, and I think they have shown some leadership, some good leadership, um, and have pushed, well, have, um, I guess it's a, a kind of an interesting dialogue between Ottawa and Toronto <laughs> uh, on, on this plan, and they seem to be cooperating fairly well, but it's gotten to the point where the federal government now have managed to implement enough of the plan to go forward in the carbon tax that and, and have put the message out very clearly that if you're not with us, we'll just go ahead and we're going to do it. Um, and you'll have to, you know, ante up. So now Saskatchewan are rethinking and have, have indicated that mm, maybe we better get on board with this in Manitoba. You know, so the Manitoba case is really important um, because, you know, you can only hold out so long and then the pressure builds with everybody else playing the game that do you want to be left out in the cold? And so you're starting to see them come in from the cold. Very interesting. That may not be a good analogy. Uh, they've just had a huge snow snowstorm. A friend of mine just uh, was trying to get home to Winnipeg. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, yeah, they have good cold there. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, if you don't try and and push the whatever windows become available, um, then you're not going to move anything forward. Yeah, so, I applaud them for trying. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen some good evidence uh, also. Um, and, you know, every every uh, region of Canada is quite different. Quebec's quite far ahead in some ways um, and have been for over a decade ahead of the curve uh, on these files. Um, maybe that's why they really are a distinct society. I don't know. But um, and, and you do see movement in different ways. And I wouldn't totally diss Alberta. They inherited an enormous challenge. Um, basically the coffers were bare. I was out in Calgary a couple of weeks ago and just seeing what the, the mayor and council of Calgary have, have been doing. It's kind of a minor miracle, actually, in some ways. Uh, so, uh, you know, even in the midst of all of the stuff around Alberta, you see some excellent things happening in Edmonton and Calgary and in, um, in some of the provincial programs as well. So, you know, they inherited, a, you know, remember when Obama was sworn in and immediately the economy collapsed, you know, uh, and he had to sort of deal with that in his very first uh, week in office, practically. Um, Alberta kind of had that thing happen. So, uh, you know, they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. But I think eventually they'll get through that. Um, yeah, Meta. Um, there are two different, or there are many, probably diff many different ways of doing a, a Robin Hood tax, taking from the rich. And one of the things that Piketty refers to in his recent book was the notion of taxing wealth as opposed to taxing income. Mm -hmm. um, what would that look like? And, and would... Uh, I'm just wondering whether this notion of a of a currency transaction tax was uh, would be actually considered a form of taxing wealth yeah. as opposed to taxing um, income. Yeah. And it, it, have have people made any comparisons about which is the most likely to result in greater 
equality. I mean, his whole thing was that inequality has increased so much, Piketty, mm -hmm. that uh, we need to do something about it just in its own terms. And, uh, and, and I guess the question is, what's the most efficient way of, of, of getting it back, you know, getting rid of the extremes of inequality? Yeah, wasn't it uh, last week I saw somewhere, you know, this thing about this billionaire who's who's uh, made all this money in marine uh, exploitation, shall we say, and he's giving all of his money to um, cleaning up the oceans. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> is that a good thing or not? You know, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, maybe it's a sin tax. I don't, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that was one of those. Oh, and then so one of the questions was, uh, should all billionaires be um, asked to contribute their uh, their billions to cleaning up the messes that they've uh, yeah, that they've made? You know, uh, so I, I just thought that was a, an interesting uh, take on it. Um, yeah, so taxing wealth is is at the root of the financial transactions tax. Yeah, and uh, currency transaction tax. Very much so. Um, yeah, and of course there are other things that are that are out there for that as well. So you need a whole suite of things if you're really going to get to you know and, and have a policy of of uh, redistribution um, for for the global public good. So what are you going to pay for? You know, are you going to let it be? A casino, because that's what it is right now in terms of, you know, speculative capital. It's a, a huge casino. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I just want to say something about youth and how important youth are. I mean, this recent shooting in Florida mm -hmm. um, gave rise to such an overwhelming response from the kids themselves. Yeah. And it just shows that they are smart, they are committed, they are concerned, they are articulate. And I think that, that um, and with the Bernie Sanders, the ones who are following Bernie Sanders, are youth like that, Not maybe not that young, but speaking out and passionate and making change. And those, those young people in Florida, and I've been reading a lot about it, and by the way, if you look at the name of the school, I sent around an email, I don't know if all of you who are on my list read it, but the name of the woman whose name is the school, the school that they went to, um, she was a remarkable activist herself and an environmentalist and changing a lot of policies. She got them, she got Florida to change a lot of its policies against blacks, for example. But if, if I get your email, I can send that to you too. But, the name of that school is, it's a woman who, but the students are really following in her footsteps in terms of activism. She lived to 108, she was a journalist, she was a lawyer, she was brilliant. And it seems to me that a lot of it is going to be from the youth, because some of us here are a little gray-headed, and there's a number of couple of young people here. But no, the next generation, and as Phyllis, you're right, we don't have seven generations. This, this has to happen now, and the fire and the passion that is needed to change the kinds of things that we're talking about tonight has to be really done with youth. And if anybody wants to look at our Just Earth, Justice for the Earth, our Just Earth website, one of the things that we're doing with youth, we trained, we had training for people to come and learn about climate change, so to be, to be prepared to go to their members of parliament to talk to them about climate change. Now what we're planning is workshops to help people to be prepared for the election that's coming up on the, the provincial election on June the 7th, it's my son's birthday, so I remember that date. But now we're going to be having workshops to help people go to all candidates' meetings to raise the issues of climate change to all these provincial um, representatives. So just, just thinking about what we have to do ourselves as well as all the international stuff, it's, I think it's really critical. Because there is a lot of, as you said, passion and activism around, and there's a lot of good people around. We have to help people to do those kinds of things and help facilitate it, because not everybody knows what to do at an at a, at a all-candidates meeting. So there's going to be training sessions, and we work with through the Center for Social Innovation, and um, there will be two workshops, I can't remember the dates, but I'll, I can send it around. And it's an activist part 
to, to train, and it's mostly young people who come to these workshops. Well, and I, would say that, I would say that that's pretty much the, the what I'm seeing in the climate movements too. Um, you know, um, I, it, maybe it's always been that, but because uh, I was in the streets in the 60s and 70s too. But um, seeing the movements of uh, growing uh, things like 350.org, that's been youth driven, even though it's had some senior mentors, if you like. Uh, but the the real activity in 350 has has been fairly youth um, driven. Um, things like Idle No More have been very youth driven. A lot of the Aboriginal um, uh, organizing around pipelines is very much uh, the passion and, and uh, stick to itiveness are from youth. Um, and in the, um, in the, uh, when I'm at the climate negotiation stuff, the, the real challenge comes from young people who are saying, it's not your world anymore, it's ours, you know, and like, let's, let's deal. So I'm, I'm hopeful as I um, engage with uh, this generation that's with us now, um, uh, moving into uh, social media spaces and uh, political arenas in a way that is now uh, more possible. Um, so uh, it gives me hope. And um, finally, just to say that uh, I think it is a, pro a project of faith. Uh, if you have faith in the, that there can be a difference, that there can be a better way, that there faith that it matters, um, uh, then you find the way to bring hope. And without that, people despair um, and nothing gets better. So that's my pitch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a wonderful talk. Very, very, and not only inspirational, but instructive. I learned a lot. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, you know, oddly, Next week is uh, kind of related to this. It just by accident turned out this way. I had approached uh, Professor Wilson Pritchard of the uh, e Department of Economics here to give a talk. And, uh, and he wants to talk on a very similar thing, some international finance. Oh, good. So we'll see uh, if you come back or bring people and make some comparisons, see what I don't know whether he's going to talk about faith, but <laughs> he's, um, he's the son of uh, Pritchard, the ex-president of the, the university. university. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so thank much. You. It's, it's been, been a real a treat. Uh, let's all go out and, and have dinner together. So, okay. <laughs> Let me say one other thing. If you haven't signed and you want a, a certificate for this, uh, you know, for being good and coming to these things, we'll give it to you. Sign the clipboard over there. And um, I want to say a little bit more about the fact that uh, we have a new series of talks starting uh, Monday, Monday night, and we're going to do it every Monday night at 8 o'clock. It's one hour long, and I'm going to be doing interviews with activists and uh, informed experts and so on, uh, mostly having to do, at least for until the forum, uh, the How to Save the World in a Hurry for, Forum uh, on May 30th and 31st. Um, all of these uh, weekly uh, lectures, which will not be in person, you can't come here to do it. It'll be at our computers. We'll be having computer people in front of their webcams all over Canada. And in fact, one, one guy is in, going to be in California and Berkeley will be participating in this discussion. So every Monday night, you look at the Peace Magazine Facebook page, and you don't have to belong to Facebook to look at it. Uh, you do have to belong to Facebook if you want to comment, but it's live streamed, and we'll have people all over the place. And next week, we'll be talking about at least starting off with a conversation about the effect on uh, climate uh, caused by the emissions of greenhouse gases from weapons. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you, militarism itself is inherently a uh, destructive uh, force for the, our environment and and uh, and our uh, especially climate. And we'll go on from there talking about things like the Arms Trade Treaty and 
other other such things. So we're all building on the same thing, and all of these things are so interconnected that I, I'm you've given us a, a very important component of it. And thank you, Martin Luther. Thank you, Martin Luther. <laughs> okay, Think let's all go out and, and, and have supper together. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Thank <laughs> you.